Hi, starting a new project today. This is a Tandy 1000. Uh, the Tandy 1000 is the second computer that I ever owned. Uh, the first one I owned was a Tandy color computer, very popular computer at the time. Um, and then the second is this Tandy 1000. This is not my Tandy 1000. Uh, mine was lost sometime back in the 90s, I think. Uh, but this is one I bought off eBay, which is the same model as what I had, the, the 25-1000A. Um, two 360K floppies, keyboard and joystick ports in the front, base memory I think of 128K, expandable beyond that with memory expansion cards. Okay, so let's power it up. Um, first you'll note I don't have a Tandy keyboard. Um, I've got this PS2 keyboard here. Um, the, when I bought this on eBay, it didn't come with keyboard. Keyboards are a little bit hard to find. Not super hard to find, there's usually one or two on eBay at a time, but they can be a little bit pricey. Expect to pan, spend between like $50 and $120 on a, uh, an original Tandy keyboard. Keyboard connector. Let's get it out of there. It's a little bit unusual in that it is an 8-pin uh, DIN connector. There's 8 pins inside of there. Um, two of them are unused, so really only six of them are needed. But what I did is I implemented myself a Tandy to PS2 adapter. So I can plug in here, normal PS2 keyboard. We've got an AT Tiny 85 sitting in the middle, and then we've got the 8 pin DIN over here going out to the uh, Tandy. Uh, so the protocol is completely different between the Tandy and the PS2 keyboard, so I had to implement a little bit of translation in the microcontroller. A lot of it is, is more complicated than you would at first um, give it credit due to some of the idiosyncrasies of the Tandy 1000. For example, the backslash key on the Tandy 1000 is over on the numeric keypad. So, see the keyboard I'm using here doesn't even have a numeric keypad. I had to uh, implement the mapping of the backslash key from the traditional AT backslash key um, to the numeric keypad. A bunch of idiosyncrasies like that, you know, things like the uh, tilde were the same thing. Various weirdness that you have to deal with in a tan. Uh, but anyway, this little adapter, I will put its source code up on my GitHub repo in case anyone wants to build one. It's really very, very, very simple. It's just basically one chip, which is an AT Tiny 85. One side it talks to the PS2, the other side it talks to the uh, Tandy. Coded it up in an evening. The other thing you'll notice is I do not have a Tandy monitor. Uh, back in the day I had the color monitor uh, that came with my Tandy 1000. I still remember the day my father and I went to the local Radio Shack. It was actually in walking distance. We walked over there I think. Um, talked to the salesman. Salesman wrote us up a quote for a Tandy 1000, the color monitor, you know whatever other accessories needed to come with it. So later that day I remember my father getting a call from the salesman saying that he had messed up the quote and he actually forgot to put the price of the color monitor in the quote. But, you know, since he was, uh, since he had written it up, his manager told him he had to stick by that quote. And if we came down and we bought that monitor and computer that day, uh, he would have to honor the price. In retrospect, I think we probably got scammed. Uh, but for me as a teenager, it meant I got a color monitor. But anyway, uh, no monitor yet for this. I'm using a LCD. This is a VGA LCD, and I have something called an MCE to VGA converter. It's in this blue box. Um, this is something you can find plans for on the web. You can build yourself one of these. It uses an FPGA to convert from CGA to uh, VGA. And it's really handy if you're doing retro computing stuff to build yourself something like this so that you can, you can uh, use your computers that don't have VGAs on, on a modern monitor. Anyway, let's turn it on. Memory size 256K. I think that means it probably does have the memory expansion board uh, probably half populated. And it's trying to access the floppies. I'm assuming the bottom one is A drive. We'll find out. BIOS ROM 1.01. 1984. Hope that uh, text is legible. Um, have a DOS 2.11 disk. This is the DOS that would have come with the Tandy 1000 version 
0.11. From my reading on the web, it sounds like uh, um, Tandy may have actually patched that DOS so that, that disk only works on a Tandy 1000. Anyway, let's watch it boot. Yeah, Tandy version 2.11.24. You can run newer DOSes, you can run DOS 3.3 on this, I'm sure, but, you know, 2.11 is what would have come with the machine, so 2.11 is what I'm sticking with. Anyway, okay, so, I mean, this is your standard DOS, it's got all your commands in there. There will be a, a basic command, probably also a basic A, an advanced one. Um, it's been a long time since I ran DOS 2.11. So yeah, so there's GW Basic 2.02. There we go. And we will see um, if I implemented the break key properly. Ah, I did! That was one of the other tricky things um, with my uh, keyboard emulator was to get the break key working because this uh, on a PS2 sends a really, 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 really weird scan code. It's like an eight byte long scan code from comes from that. So you got to trap it anyway. Anyway, I digress. If you want to know more about the um, the converter, uh, check out my GitHub repo and you know the source code will be there. Um, so anyway, there we go. Um, I know there's a way. Exit uh, the basic. Wait, I don't know what it is, but we'll just hit. And it's nice to put the reset button down there. Hit the reset button. Boot back into DOS. And then we're going to try out DeskMate. Put that in the B drive. Deskmate was some software that Tandy bundled with the computer. It was very popular at the time. And it should include like a word processor, a spreadsheet, etc., etc. Deskmate 1.01, um, 1984. Monochrome looking. So we've got uh, text, that'll be our word processor, uh, worksheet, filer, uh, mail. Mail could it send and receive? Who knows? Let's do the README. Okay, yeah. So it's it's you know it's a word processor. I can type on it. Let's go up and Um, anyway, you know, word processor, we could type into it. Um, the Tandy keyboard did actually have 12 function keys. It only lists 10 of them on here, but you actually needed uh, all 12 of them. And this was kind of a new thing at the time because F12 is the exit button. There we go. We've exited uh, Deskmate. We're back here. We can go into the budget. There we go. So there's, you know, some kind of spreadsheet that came with it. Um, I need car payment, two hundred and fifty dollars, eighty bucks a month in gas, rent of four hundred. Really, rent was four hundred bucks back in nineteen eighty four. I would have thought rent would have been less than that. Um, insurance, groceries. Times have changed. Um, anyway, so I think you can get a pretty good feel for Deskmate and what all it does. Uh, so anyway, I think we want to upgrade a few things on this. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to try to upgrade the memory. And we're going to see if we can increase the memory on the board from uh, 128K to 256. That would give us a total of 384K of RAM. I'm also going to try to install a clock calendar. Because every time you boot up a computer, you know, having to enter the time and date is kind of annoying. So um, let's get at it. 
So we've got it unplugged. Um, taking the Tandy 1000 apart is really pretty simple. All it has is two screws that go in through the front. And this piece slides off. Okay, so you can kind of see it's got uh, one card installed, and that's the memory card. So I'm going to pull that card out there so we can look at it. There are two other slots. Uh, we'll put in some good uh, top-down pictures of the thing when I get my camera moved over here. Um, but for now, let me pull out this card uh, so we can get a look at the uh, memory board. One Tandy 1000 memory board, half populated. Okay, here is the memory board sitting here on the bench. Um, an interesting thing about the Tandy 1000 architecture is that the CPU board did not have a DMA chip. Now, DMA stands for uh, Direct Memory Access, and DMA is a method of offloading the CPU uh, so, that, um, so that memory can be transferred uh, without needing to involve the CPU. So you can kind of tell the DMA controller to go move a memory block from here to there, and your CPU can go on doing computation. Um, now that was particularly handy with hard drive controllers and perhaps even floppy controllers in that it can do a disk transfer without burdening the CPU. That was not built into the motherboard, which was kind of unusual. Um, perhaps a cost-saving measure. There's certainly room to put it on the motherboard had you wanted to, uh, but they did not. Um, they put it here instead. So this is a DMA controller. Part number on that is an 8237A. Um, now this board can hold up to uh, 256 kilobytes of memory um, and as little as 128. So they have soldered in the first uh, 18 chips, uh, which is the first bank of 128. There are nine uh, chips across by two rows. The reason there is nine instead of eight is because of the parity bit. And these are 64K by one DRAM chips. I looked it up online and they are 150 nanosecond. Uh, so what we do if we can get some more DRAM chips that are 64K uh, by one and 150 nanosecond or faster, um, populate up those sockets and see if we can get this thing going. Um, these DRAM chips are a part number 8043665. Um, I looked up, I couldn't really find any 8043665 DRAM chips, but I did, from a place just across the state, find a whole tube of 4164 um, 120 nanosecond DRAM chips. So what we are going to do is populate this board. Okay, I pulled out uh, one too many. So anyway, we're ready to plug this board into the computer. Let's plug it in and see how it works. Okay, I'm fooling with you. Did you really think I was going to plug it in with the with the couple of the chips in upside down? This one, this one, this one. Looks like just three of them are in upside down. Um, no, I wasn't really going to do that. I was going to double check it before I plug it in. Um, I actually have to get it a little bit closer to my eyes to make sure I get them in the correct orientation. Um, and then uh, while I'm doing that, I'm also going to check and make sure that all of the pins are in. There's no bent pins. There's no chip offset. So anyway, let me flip these um, one, two, three upside down ones, and then we'll plug the board in. This is floppy drive. This is the, um, the B drive, the top drive in the computer. Um, I believe it's a... TIAC, um, should be an FD55B, yeah, FD54B, FD54B02U. Um, it was, it's been making kind of a wonky noise um, on tracks 33 and above. There was like some grinding and bouncing back and forth. I'm wondering if something is just obstructing the... Uh, the travel to head. Maybe there's some old grease or some dirt on there. So I was going to pull the drive. Just take a take a peek inside of the mechanism. And make sure that the head is sliding back and forth freely, not uh, not running into anything that's causing friction. 
all sliding. Hopefully this is easy to get into. There we go. There's the drive head. I'm seeing a little bit of dust in there. Nothing, nothing looks really bad. Looks like it has full travel without any obstruction. Now let's clamp it down and look at it. Really not uh, seeing any problems. I do think I'll just take and lightly swab what I can of this sliding rail. Got some isopropyl alcohol on this. Particularly as we get out here to this side, which would be where track is, uh, 30 through 40 are at. Well, we seem to have gotten a, a little bit of dirt off of there. A bunch of this is just coming off the surface in there though. Let's also just try to lightly oil it. Got some deoxid. My gut feeling is a little bit of this probably goes a long ways. And we picked up a little bit of more dirt on the swab, but I'm going to say this drive feels like it's sliding fine. Feel like there's any problems in there for sure. Okay, the final upgrade I'm going to install is this clock calendar board. This is the Tandy 1000 mouse controller calendar board. Um, I picked this up on eBay. I probably spent too much for it, but it seemed like a unique thing. I never did have this back in the day. Um, but the ability to have a battery backed up clock um, seems useful because who likes to set the time and date every time you turn on the computer. Uh, so I have no idea how this thing works. I have read up a little bit and some people think this is probably a bus mouse. Uh, bus mice were different than serial mice. Serial mice communicated over serial protocol. Bus mice, I think what they often did was they ran the, um, the encoder and button wires directly into the computer. Uh, through some kind of interfacing and to the board so you could read the encoders directly rather than have to read them over serial. Maybe that allowed you to make a simpler mouse, I don't know. Um, I did look at this connector and I can see there are a total of two power lines. Uh, there's a plus down here and a ground so it looks like you know from these pin numbers that are marked maybe they're one and two. I'll put the breakout on it at some point and find out. Uh, so two power lines, uh, hot and uh, ground and a total of seven data lines. Now if you have uh, two buttons and two encoders, uh, each of the encoders should be two lines, the two buttons will each be a line, that would be six data lines. So I've got like one too many. Um, I don't know. Have to look around, see if I can find any more resources. Um, I'll take some high-res pictures later, try to figure out what these chips are. I think this one says it's um, Big one looks like an 8042. Um, there is a um, little uh, adjustment here and a crystal next to this little one. This SAE 3019P. This looks too small to be a clock chip to me, but you know, maybe, or maybe this is just uh, conditioning logic for that uh, crystal. I don't know. We'll have to look and see what we can find out from these chips, but. Um, this uh, 8042 and this SAE 3019P, those are the two that are socketed. We also have a CR2320 battery here. I've already put the multimeter on it and that battery is completely dead. Uh, no juice in that thing at all. So I'm going to see if I can get the battery out. 
there it is, a CR2320. Um, I don't think I have any CR2320s. So by comparison purposes, here is a CR2032. You can see a little bit smaller than the 2320. Uh, maybe a little bit thicker. That could be a problem. Let's see if we can make it fit. Positive side up. Okay, bring it over here so it did fit. Um, it is in there securely. It's not, uh, it kind of wobbles around a little bit, but I don't think it's going anywhere. Certainly it's smaller and thicker. Um, I may see if I can source a 2320, put the right battery in. Um, but in the meantime, I think 2032 will work just fine. I'm going to install this card back in the computer. Okay, let's boot the computer back up again. See what happens. Okay, 384K. Um, that is good. It's recognized the additional uh, 128K that we installed. Booting up, I've got the DOS disk in there again. Okay, we have DigiMouse controller and calendar utilities. Clock get, clock set, L-O-C-K-G-E-T, let's see what happens. Clock battery has failed since the clock was last set. Well, that's obvious because we uh, did replace the battery. If you've not replaced the battery, please do so. Okay, we just did that, then set the dates at the time, run clock set. And I guess it's just going to uh, hang until we reboot. Let's reboot. Okay, today's date would be May 10th. 5, 10, 2020. Well, now what's going to happen with that? I think it's going to take 2020. I don't know, it looks like it did. Let's do uh, 14, 29. Did it really take that 2020 date? It did! Ah! What is this no Y2K problem on an ancient DOS computer? What do you know? Now if we do drive B, clock set, write protect error reading drive B. Okay, I kind of put this, uh, put this write protect sticker on there because I didn't want it writing to the drive, but maybe for some reason you need to write to the drive to set it. Don't know why. Don't need to know why. It's just going to hang again. Here, yeah, let's try booting off of DOS 3.3. Okay, that worked. So, um, that's annoying. It appears that it is incompatible with DOS 2.1.1. Did it actually set the date? It did. Did it set the time? It did. Um, but apparently I can't use DOS 2.1.1 with this Digimouse thing. Um, okay, so I've had a measure of success. I went online and I downloaded a different version of the clock utilities for the clock calendar board. Um, I don't know if it's an older version or a newer version, but I can see the clock uh, get.exe, it's a different length. Um, and if we run it, and this is DOS 2.11 I've got installed, we run it, it does not hang on exit, so that's great. Um, so I have edited my Auto exec dot bat. 
automatically run the tool. Oops. I've edited my config.sys to automatically load the mouse driver. It does come with a demo program. I'm kind of curious to see what the demo program does. Let's run. It's on B colon, I think. Piano dot bass. See what happens. Okay, we've got a screen and we've got a mouse pointer. What we don't have, unfortunately, is a mouse. Um, when I bought the board, and I knew this at the time, the board didn't include a mouse. Um, this takes something called a Tandy Digi Mouse. I've looked on eBay, I don't see a Tandy Digi Mouse anywhere, so I don't know exactly where I'm going to find one, but I do have a plan. And the plan is this this is a Microsoft Inport mouse. It has this kind of funky round, uh, like an eight or nine pin mini DIN connector on it. But it is supposed to be a bus mouse. Um, look how yellow that is, the top compared to the bottom. It's white on the bottom. It's this horrible color on the top. Oh, my light just turned off. Um, anyway, so my thoughts are, I bought this on eBay for all of $6, this import mouse. I'm going to take it apart, look at it, see if it looks like I expect it to look like it's just a couple of encoders and a couple of buttons going out the cable. If it is that, then I'm going to hack the end off of it, put a DB9 on it, figure out the pinout, put the word Tandy across it, and call it a Tandy Digimouse, and see if I can get the mouse driver to work. Okay, here are the innards of the uh, Microsoft Inport mouse, and it is pretty much exactly what I expected. Two encoders, one there, one there, two buttons, four of what looked like they could be little decoupling capacitors or something like that. That's it. So out this connector is going to be, um, you know, there'll be a power, a ground, uh, a pair of encoder wires for each encoder, and then a couple uh, button wires is what I expect to be on there. We'll hack this off, we will experiment with hooking it up to the uh, Tandy connector, and we will see if we can get this Digimouse to work. Okay, I managed to get the mouse working. Uh, so where I started was to look up the pinout of the Microsoft Inport mouse. Uh, you can see the connector here with some of my scribbles on it. I mapped each pin on the connector to the color, uh, basically by cutting the end off and taking a multimeter to check them. Then I went online and I checked the pin out, matched the uh, pin numbers to the colors and wrote down a chart. So like blue is mouse switch three, um, red is X encoder B, uh, brown is X encoder A, etc. Um, green was switch one. Um, that was enough to decode uh, the wiring in the import so I knew which, uh, which mouse wire uh, was which signal. Then I hooked up to the DB9 on the Tandy, I hooked up this breakout board, put my multimeter on and I found uh, 5 volts on the first two pins. So the first pin was ground, uh, pin 2 was plus 5 volt. Uh, once you've got that, you figure out which uh, pin's power is coming on and then you just check the other pins. And I found that a total of 4 of the pins, which would be uh, these two down here, which are um, pins 4 and 5, as well as pins 8 and 9, they had 100k pull downs to ground. So that is something that has a pull down to ground and presumably you put a, a 5 volt signal in it to uh, generate a signal on. So I figured there's four of those, there's four encoder wires, those are probably the encoders. I took um, the common on the uh, Import mouse, I wired it to the 5 volt line and then I took the four encoders and hooked them up to there. Had to uh, shuffle around the wires a little bit, but eventually the encoders worked just fine. Um, that left three other pins, and those three other pins were pins 3, which is that one, 
as well as pins uh, 6 and 7, which are these two. Each of those had about a 3K pull up. So that is a signal that you would put uh, ground on in order to generate a, a signal. Uh, I figured those were probably the mouse buttons, but unfortunately the import mouse only has one common that feeds both the encoders and the buttons. Um, so we've got, um, for the encoders we needed an active high signal, for the buttons we need an active low signal. I don't know why Tandy did this, it seems crazy, why couldn't you make them all uh, active high um, instead of mixing them. Unfortunately there was just no way to make that work without adding an extra component, which is this here, which is a 7404 hex inverter. So all we do here is we invert the two button signals and then feed them into pins um, 6 and 7. And after that the mouse is working, there's one pin which is left unhooked which was pin 3. My hypothesis is that's just for a third mouse button. So what I will probably do, I will probably um, remove this breakout board, wire all of these up to a, a DB9 connector, maybe put some shrink wrap around the uh, hex inverter, um, and I'll have myself a Digi mouse. Um, if you want to be really clever you can take the hex inverter maybe and hide it inside the mouse case. I don't really want to have to try to modify the mouse, it seems like a pain. Uh, so I'll just hang the inverter on some shrink wrap and maybe uh, zip tie it down to part of the cable or something like that. I'll figure it out. Just drawing a piano. Okay, so as you can see I can move the mouse up and down, the mouse pointer moves around. I can move it left and right, the mouse pointer moves exactly as it should, pushing um, the first button produces a low sound, pushing the second button produces a high sound. Doing uh, what it's supposed to do, so I think this was successful. I was able to get the import mouse hooked up to the Tandy mouse card. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sandrail stuff. Bye. Okay, it's time for the bonus material. It wouldn't be a proper PC vintage computing video if we didn't load up some King's Quest 1. Let's try this out. Let's see if we can see the nice Tandy sound and graphics. Here is Sir Graham. Let's navigate Sir Graham to the castle without stepping on any alligators. Go Sir Graham. Of course every time there's a screen transition we need to load from floppy. We are in the point. Only 157 points to go.
Let's talk to the king. Don't have anything to say? Talk to the king. There we go. You speak to King Edward. He sighs and says, Sir Graham, I'm an old man. I fear my end is near. I have chosen you to prove yourself worthy of the throne. As you know, our kingdom is weak and poor. I have knowledge of the existence of three things that would make our kingdom wealthy and strong. Somewhere within our kingdom, there is a magic mirror that tells the future. There is a magic shield that will protect the bearer from mortal harm. Finally, there is a magic chest that is always filled with gold coins. Go, Sir Graham. Go and bring me back these treasures. If you succeed, you will inherit the throne. Well, I think with that mirror, that chest, and uh, that shield, I could probably just take the throne by force if I wanted to. Um, anyway, there we have it. King's Quest. I'm a Tandy 1000.